Hey everybody, welcome back. Ms. Calabrese here. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be um, continuing our discussion of the immune system by talking about uh, the adaptive wing of your immune system or your third line of defense. All right, so adaptive or acquired immunity um, is the part of your immunity that you have to build over time, right? So this is, this is not a part of your immune system that you're born with. Um, it has to be learned. Um, by responding to the, the presence of different antigens um, that are received in the body, right? So, so first, um, the first step of this whole process is gonna be the development of the lymphocytes to begin with. So, so your adaptive immunity is really mediated by your two um, classes of lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes or B cells and the T lymphocytes or T cells. Um, the B lymphocytes are going to be uh, in charge of uh, part of this uh, innate system that we refer to as the cell-mediated immunity, and the B lymphocytes are going to be associated with the humoral line of defense or your um, antibody-mediated immunity. Okay, so as far as lymphocyte development goes, so um, no matter what type of lymphocyte we're talking about, um, they're going to initiate from the same type of stem cell that we're going to find in the bone marrow. So so with a few exceptions, um, almost all blood cell production happens in the bone marrow. Um, and in the bone marrow is where the B cells are going to stay and continue their maturation until they're fully competent immune cells. Um, the T cells or the T lymphocytes are gonna migrate from the bone marrow to your thymus gland. And then the thymus gland is where those T cells are going to mature. Um, and after maturation, then both of these cells are gonna leave those respective areas and they're gonna be circulating around, we find them uh, in throughout your lymphatic system, uh, your, in your bloodstream, in your split, uh, spleen, and in your lymph nodes. All right, so here's a kind of overview image of what this uh, lymphocyte development and differentiation looks like. So again, if we're kind of following it from the top down here, um, we can see that we have a stem cell uh, in the bone marrow. Um, that that uh, pregenitor cell is going to develop into both the B cells and the T cells. Uh, the B cells are going to stay in the bone marrow and from that point they're gonna mature. Uh, the T cells are gonna to migrate to the thymus where they will mature. After maturation, then both of them are going to leave and circulate around in the blood, find their way to the lymph nodes and the spleen. Um, at that point then, the B cells and the T cells are gonna have uh, fairly different jobs um, from the point that they are activated um, and actually being a functional part of your immune system. So the B cells are going to head up the humoral defense, so, that's, so the humoral wing of your uh, adaptive immune system. The T cells are going to head up the cell-mediated line of adaptive immunity. Um, and these, these two different lines work very differently uh, in order to fight uh, infection. And we'll talk in detail about what's happening in each one of these two cascades here. All right, so just to kind of give you an overview of where we've been before and where we're heading next, remember that um, as a pathogen crosses the first line of defense, so it gets in through a mucous membrane or it gets in through your skin or, or however the, the pathogen finds its way into the body, um, it's going to, after crossing the first line of defense, it's gonna encounter the second line of defense. And second line of defense, um, ideally it's gonna run into um, some sort of phagocyte, a macrophage uh, potentially, uh, is going to be signaled to come to that site that that macrophage is then going to ingest the pathogen and inflammate the inflammatory or initiate the inflammatory response right so then we can start our inflammatory response which is going to bring even more blood cells to the area so that we can uh, really try to take down this pathogen um, the next thing that's going to happen is the second line of defense is going to interact with the third line of defense so those um, that phagocyte um, whatever type of phagocyte it might be, a macrophage or a dendritic cell, which is another type of um, phagocytic cell, it's going to, after ingesting that pathogen, uh, it's going to digest it, break it down, uh, and then it's going to present a portion of that pathogen to a T lymphocyte, specifically a helper T cell. Um, so that, that helper T cell uh, will then receive that information from the second line of defense. This is kind of like the handoff between your second line of defense and your third line of defense. Second line of defense finds these bad guys after they've crossed the first line and they take them to the third line, which is gonna be the more specific response. Um, and then that, uh, that T cell is gonna basically take it from there. Now, all of this adaptive immunity 
um, is going to be based on, um, again, cell surface receptors. So any kind of um, molecular patterns on the surface of potential pathogens um, and molecular patterns on the surface of your own cells, um, these, are, these are what your adaptive immunity is based on. It's just recognition of these different patterns. Um, so your, your immune system is looking for antigens. So antigens are any molecule that your immune system can uh, recognize as being foreign that can provoke an immune response. So any foreign molecule uh, can be antigenic if it can uh, stimulate an immune response. Um, and those antigens, those are gonna be very, very specific. So antigens associated with, with one uh, type of bacteria are gonna be different molecular shapes than the antigens associated with another type of bacteria or virus or protozoan or whatever it might be. So antigens are highly specific molecules. Right. Um, and even antigens themselves can have multiple uh, different antigenic determinants or epitopes. So that means on the shape of one of these, these surface molecules for say a bacteria, um, we might be able to recognize that shape from multiple different angles. Um, and so each one of those different angles is going to be uh, considered an epitope. So think if you're, um, uh, you can kind of think about like a, a law enforcement analogy here when it comes to your immune system. If you're thinking of an antigen as like a, a possible criminal, right? This is someone who, who we don't want in the body because they're, they're capable of causing damage. Um, that antigen is, is the criminal. The epitopes think about it as like different angles of the, of the mugshot. So we're seeing this, this, um, this antigen from different angles and we're able to, to mount an immune response against each of those different angles so that we can see them from all sides, essentially. So an epitope is just a, a part of, uh, of the antigen that your immune system can recognize all on its own. Okay, so this entire wing of your immune system, the third line of defense or adaptive immunity is based on two concepts and those are specificity and memory. So specificity meaning that here we are recognizing specific, specific antigens. Um, we're not, um, this is not the basic kind of general distinguishing between self and non-self. Uh, it's doing that, but in addition to that, we're distinguishing between different antigens um, of, of these non-self uh, molecules. So we can tell the difference between, um, between one strain of Staph aureus and the next strain of Staph aureus because they're gonna have slightly different cell surface receptors that are gonna create slightly different antigens that we can recognize in our body. So very, very specific. Uh, in addition to that, this part of your immune system generates memory. Uh, and that means that once we've encountered a particular antigen, so say, um, antigens, antigenic molecules associated with a particular cold virus, um, it's going to remember those antigens and it's going to be able to form an even more robust immune response the next time you encounter that same uh, particular antigen. So this is why you never get the same version of a cold twice um, because you've developed memory for that initial um, antigens that were associated with that particular cold. All right. So in order for this to work properly, like I said, we're going to need some communication between uh, the second line of defense and the third line of defense. Um, and that's going to come by way of cells that we refer to as antigen presenting cells. So these are cells that are capable of um, phagocytizing a, a pathogen uh, and then presenting uh, an antigen of that pathogen, so a portion of that pathogen on the surface and presenting it to a T cell. Right, so and antigen presenting cells can be uh, macrophages, they can be dendritic cells, which are phagocytic cells associated with the skin, um, or they can be B cells. B cells can also act as antigen presenting cells uh, at times. And so basically what these APCs are doing is ingesting the pathogen, digesting it, breaking it down, uh, and then taking a portion, an antigen, so just a, a molecular portion of that pathogen and presenting it on the surface of the cell and taking it and showing it to a T cell. All right. Um, one of the things um, that we're going to need to understand before we move any further into understanding your specific immune system are your own cell surface receptors. So these are the these are um, proteins that we find on the surface of our own cells. Um, now you have a group of genes uh, called the major histocompatibility complex. 
Uh, and remember that genes are just recipes for proteins. So this major histocompatibility complex is a series of genes um, that code for proteins that are very important in your specific immune response. All right, so, and we're gonna divide these genes into three separate classes and talk about what each of these three separate classes are gonna do um, to help uh, your immune response. All right, so MHC class one genes, major histocompatibility class one genes, these code for proteins um, that act as self-recognition markers on the surface of your cells. So the, um, on the surface of all nucleated cells in your body, so all the cells that have nuclei in your body, which is most, um, are going to have these glycoproteins, these sugar protein combinations on the surface of the cells. And these are gonna be unique to you. So everyone has a unique set of MHC class one genes that code for a unique ID, ID cards, essentially, that are, um, that are uh, propped up on the surface of all your nucleated cells, right? So these are um, what your immune system encounters when they encounter, when immune cells encounter your own body cells. They're gonna see um, that you have that MHC class one that matches you, uh, and they're gonna recognize that as a self cell and not, not destroy that cell, All right? So everyone's got their own MHC class one. No two people are gonna have identical MHC class one, um, unless you have an identical twin, it would be the only uh, exception to that rule. All right, so MHC class one self ID, that's on the surface of every nucleated cell. MHC class two, um, these are only, these genes code for proteins that are only found on the surface of antigen presenting cells. So MHC class two genes create proteins um, that we find on the surface of macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Uh, and that's because these proteins are, are the actual proteins that are presenting the antigen to the T cell. So these are, these are found on the surface of only those APCs. Uh, and then MHC class three genes, these genes code for the proteins in your complement system. So remember the complement proteins are those, um, those blood proteins uh, that can be triggered to, uh, to poke holes, create those membrane attack complexes in the surface of bacterial cells when directed to do so by antibodies. So you can imagine that this, these complex, this complex of genes is gonna be incredibly important for your immune function and immune health. All right, so here's what some of these look like. Um, so in the picture on the left, we can see an MHC class one uh, protein here. So a protein that, that was coded for by that MHC class one gene. Um, and again, that's just gonna be on the surface of every one of your cells that has a nucleus is gonna have that cell surface receptor, and it's gonna look slightly different. The shape of it's gonna be different for every single person. Um, so that's on every nucleated cell. The picture on the right there shows um, what we would find on the surface of an antigen presenting cell. So this would only be on a B cell, a macrophage, or a dendritic cell. And we can see that it also has an MHC class one. Um, um, so the MHC class one is, is this guy here. But in addition to that, we've got the proteins coded for by the MHC class two, which is this kind of lobster claw looking hands right here. And essentially what, what this guy does is hold the antigen. So uh, I'll draw you a little antigen. It's gonna be just a little yellow triangle, but pretend that's a little antigen that's being held onto by this MHC class two protein on the surface of this antigen presenting cell. All right, so a closer look at one of these antigen presenting cells. So dendritic cells, we haven't talked about too much, um, but dendritic cells are a type of phagocytic cell um, that we find um, a lot in tissues that have contact with the external environment. So like skin or mucous membranes is where you're gonna find a lot of these dendritic cells. Uh, and they're capable of phagocytizing pathogens that try to enter into the body in that way. All right, and then they're gonna be able to do the same thing as a macrophage. Um, which is ingest that pathogen, break it down, and then present the pathogen on its surface to uh, a helper T cell, right? So this antigen presentation um, is incredibly important for initiating your third line of defense or your adaptive immunity. All right, so here's what that looks like. So in the picture on the, on the right-hand side here, so we've got our antigen presenting cell, whatever this might be, a T cell, or I'm sorry, a B cell, a dendritic cell, or a macrophage. Um, we can see the MHC class two protein is the green here. That MHC class two is holding onto the antigen 
uh, and it's presenting that antigen to a T cell. So the T cell also has cell surface proteins here. Um, and his is called, sometimes just called a T cell receptor. Um, and that T cell receptor, also called an antigen binding site, is going to be there to receive the antigen presented by the antigen presenting cell. So once we have that, that presentation happening, then we've got recognition of that antigen by that inactive helper T cell. Now that he's been warned of what the enemy looks like, what this particular antigen that's, that's infecting the body looks like, he can begin to mount uh, an immune response specific to that particular antigen. So what he's gonna do then um, is trigger the production of a whole lot more um, lymphocytes that are going to be tailored specific to, to attack that particular pathogen. So he's gonna do things like um, create uh, more uh, cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells can directly go um, attack cells that have been uh, infected by viruses. He can create B cells, and B cells are gonna be important for our humoral or antibody-mediated response. All right, so, so here's kind of an overview of this cascade of events, All right? So here's our, here's our pathogen pathogen gains entry into the body somehow, so it manages to, manages to get past your first line of defense, um, and at, at some point it's going to um, encounter a phagocyte. So macrophage or dendritic cell is going to find this pathogen and eat it. He is then going to um, produce uh, an antigen from that uh, pathogen on his surface in his MHC class II protein uh, and present that to a T cell. So here's our antigen presentation to the helper T cell. Once that helper T cell becomes activated, then you can think of your helper T cells as like the, the guys in control, like the generals in charge of your immune armed forces. All right, so that helper T cell is then gonna be able to send out cellular messages that are going to initiate both a cell mediated response that's run by T cells or an antibody mediated humoral response that's run by B cells. All right, so both of these are gonna be important uh, in controlling uh, infection. All right, so, so here's kind of a, a, review, a review of that concept again. So the bone marrow, red bone marrow specifically, is where we're making these lymphocytes, both B cells and T cells. Um, the B cells remain in the bone marrow to mature. The T cells migrate to the thymus to mature. Um, and then once they mature, um, then they are capable of recognition of antigens. Um, so for, for this uh, to happen, typically we need a T cell to be presented uh, with an antigen by an antigen presenting cell. Um, but there are some cases where the B cell can do this all on its own and activate itself. But then we start these two kind of separate wings of this, um, this cascade, right? So we have a cascade that's going to result in the production of a whole bunch of T cell clones. And those are gonna be cytotoxic T cells. We're gonna get memory T cells, helper T cells. Uh, and then we're also going to have a B cell cascade that's going to produce memory B cells and plasma cells uh, that are going to be important for your antibody mediated line of defense. And again, this all comes down um, to antigen recognition. So the fact that we can recognize these very specific antigens, uh, which are molecular patterns associated with, with foreign molecules. All right, so a kind of review of the cell mediated immunity here. So once that helper T cell gets um, activated by an antigen presenting cell, um, he is going to um, uh, cause the proliferation of clones, essentially. Clones that are capable of recognizing that very particular antigen that we're being infected with. So one of the type of clones he's gonna make are cytotoxic T cells. And those cytotoxic T cells are capable of destroying body cells that have been infected by intracellular pathogens. So that's usually viruses, uh, but there are intracellular pathogens that are uh, bacteria and uh, protozoa as well. All right, so here's, here's a picture of what part of that T cell cascade looks like. So here we can see the thymus gland uh, and where it sits in the body. So just kind of above the heart here is where your thymus gland is, where those T cells mature. Um, and then we can see the activation here happening again. So the MHC class II protein presenting uh, the antigen to an inactive helper T cell, which is gonna activate him and start the production of all these clones. So we're gonna get um, um, some more helper T cells. We're gonna get some memory cells. 
Um, and then we're also going to activate the cytotoxic T cells. And the cytotoxic T cells, these are these are cells that can go out and directly murder an infected cell. So they can they can take a cell that's been infected with um, a virus or some other intracellular pathogen and uh, cause it um, to either destroy itself or or it will destroy it on its own. Um, and that's going to be important to prevent the proliferation of the virus or whatever is, uh, happens to be infecting that cell. All right. Um, and the way that these cytotoxic T's work is uh, one of two possible mechanisms here. So in the in the in the uh, the picture on the left hand side here, this one, we can see this T cell is creating uh, enzymes called granzymes. Um, those granzymes are going to go inside um, the cell and they're going to cause the cell to kill itself. Right? They're going to trigger what's called apoptosis or programmed cell death. It's going to cause that body cell to kill itself. As the body cell gets destroyed, all of those pathogens that were on the inside of it are now released. Um, and there's usually a waiting phagocyte in the wings that's going to be ready to eat all of those microbes that got released from, from the now dead body cell, right? Um, so that's how granzymes work. On, on the right-hand side here, we can see um, this other mechanism that involves another couple of things called perforins and granulysins. Um, so perforins do, do basically what they sound like they do. They perforate, right? They, they create little holes in the surface of the cell. Um, and those holes are going to allow entry of granulysins. Granulysins are going to go in and actually kill um, the, in, the, infections, the infectious agents that are on the inside of that cell. So the granulysins actually destroy the microbes from the inside. Uh, and in this case, the cell will also end up dying. Okay, um, the way antibody mediated immunity works is a little bit more hands off, right? So cell mediated immunity is very direct. We're actually killing body cells. Um, in antibody mediated immunity, we're mainly creating antibodies uh, and those antibodies are going to be of incredible importance to the immune system, but antibodies don't actually eliminate pathogens on their own. Um, they're still incredibly important uh, but it's it's sort of like a, a multi-step process on how an antibody can lead to the destruction of a pathogen. All right, so here's what our B cell cascade looks like. Um, so we can we can have a, a B cell be activated on its own. So B cells can do its own activation by interaction interacting with the pathogen, or we can activate them by uh, interaction um, co-stimulation with a helper T cell. And then once, once we have this activated B cell, he's going to start his own cascade where he's going to form clones. Some of those clones are going to be plasma cells, uh, and some of those clones are going to be memory B cells. And remember, all of these are going to be created um, uh, uh, specific to whatever um, antigen is infecting the body at this point. OK, so let's look at the structure of an antibody um, just so that we understand how these work, what they look like. Um, so antibodies are going to be created by B cells. Um, they're going to be created in large amounts by plasma cells, which are uh, short-lived B cells that are going to just make a ton of antibodies. Their whole job is to just pump out antibodies like crazy. They don't live that long. But they make lots and lots of antibodies. Uh, and the antibody looks like this. So it's a protein that's in the shape of a Y. Um, this Y-shaped protein has a couple portions to it. Uh, that we refer to as, so let me kind of highlight here. So these that I'm highlighting right now are the heavy chains. So these are the, the actual kind of Y-shaped part of the molecule. These are the heavy chains. Uh, and then we also have some light chains, and the light chains are these shorter strings um, that are kind of on the outside of the Y a little bit. So heavy chains and light chains. Um, the Y is held together in the middle through disulfide bonds. So these couple little bonds here holding this um, molecule together. Right? And then uh, other things we should note about the structure of an antibody. Um, down here, this kind of like the base of the Y, um, this is the stem region of the antibody. You might see it referred to as the crystallizable fragment or F sub C. Um, that's going to be where the antibody can anchor itself onto the surface of a cell. Um, up here, at the kind of ends of the arms of the Y, these are antigen binding sites. This is where the antibody can get very, very specific. So we can create antibodies 
um, in trillions, literally trillions of different shapes. And those shapes are going to be able to respond to any, any potential foreign molecule that enters into the body. So, and that's, that's because these uh, antigen binding sites are considered hyper variable. So the shapes of them can change um, uh, or the, the shapes of them can be of so many different shapes that we can potentially develop antibodies for any, any external path or antigen. All right, so what do antibodies actually do then? So if these are just proteins that are secreted by T cells, um, what's, what's the point? How do they help your immune system? Um, and they, they basically have a few different jobs here. Um, so one of the big things that they can do is just neutralize. Um, they can surround um, a pathogen um, by, by using those hypervariable regions. So the regions on the end of the arms of the Y can fit into antigens that are on the surface of bacteria or viruses or protozoa or whatever they might be. Um, and, and that is going to be a trigger for a phagocyte. It basically tells a phagocyte um, that this is definitely an enemy that we need to neutralize. Um, they can also initiate that complement cascade. Uh, they do this process called opsonization, which is completely surrounding the pathogen. Um, so these are all activities that the antibodies do that are going to lead to the eventual destruction of that pathogen, even though the antibody itself is not um, the cause of the damage to the pathogen. All right, so here's, here's a way to visualize all these different antibody activities. So in this first picture here at the top, um, what's going on here is called opsonization. So here we see a whole bunch of antibodies with their hypervariable regions grabbing onto antigens on the surface of this particular bacterium. So this guy is considered opsonized um, because he's completely surrounded uh, by, by antibodies. Um, now what's going to happen is because he's opsonized, he's, he's basically a, a, a even larger target for a white blood cell. So this helps um, white blood cells like macrophages or neutrophils identify a pathogen and eat it more quickly. Right? So opsonization is a way of surrounding this pathogen to trigger phagocytosis. Um, what's happening over here uh, in this picture is called neutralization. And neutralization is basically um, now we're surrounding a virus. And each one of these antibodies is bonded to a spike, um, which is the, the proteins that viruses use to attach onto host cells. So if those spikes that the virus uses to adhere to a host cell are blocked by antibodies, the virus can't adhere to a host cell uh, and it can't gain entry into the host cell, which means it can't reproduce. So, so blocking the spikes is going to prevent binding, which will prevent reproduction of that virus and also um, trigger phagocytosis of the virus. All right, so that's neutralization. Um, down here, we've got agglutination. So agglutination, if you can look at these individual antibodies here and see that each arm of the Y-shaped molecule here is, is um, attached to a different uh, bacterium in this picture. So each Y is holding on to two different bacteria. So if you have multiple antibodies that are each holding on to two bacteria, um, you can get this cross linkage where they're all sort of clumped together. And that process is called agglutination. Uh, and agglutination basically creates this clump of pathogens that then become sitting ducks for a macrophage to come along and eat them. So this is also going to encourage phagocytosis. Um, what's happening here in this middle picture on the bottom is complement-induced lysis. So we are um, the antibodies that have opsonized this bacteria are triggering activation of the complement proteins. So those complement proteins can develop those membrane attack complexes and poke a hole um, in, in that uh, pathogen. So complement lysis. And then the last one here uh, is antitoxicity. So this is what they're showing you in this picture is a toxin created by a bacterium gets secreted by that bacterium. And instead of that toxin being able to do damage, it can be completely surrounded by antibodies, which essentially neutralizes the toxin. So that's an antitoxicity function. So these are all things that your antibodies are capable of doing to help protect you in cases of infection, even though the antibodies themselves are not causing um, the, the direct harm to the pathogen itself. They are triggering multiple different functions of your immune system. Okay.
So um, antibodies, we can divide into kind of five separate major classes. Um, and you'll, you'll see the word there, immunoglobulin. So immunoglobulin is another uh, way to refer to these antibodies um, so that we can get more specific about the different types of antibodies. So the first one listed here, IgG, um, immunoglobulin G, um, usually exists as a monomer, which means it's just one single Y-shaped molecule here. IgG is the, um, the, the most numerous um, antibody that you have in your serum at any given time, about 80% of the circulating, circulating antibodies are going to be IgG. Um, this antibody um, is going to be really important for all of those um, all of those antibody functions that we just talked about. So the agglutination, the neutralization, the optimization, all of that can be done by IgG. Um, uh, it's going to um, also be able to cross the placenta. So this is um, this particular antibody can can cross the placenta and help protect the fetus as well. Right. So and it's the only one that's capable of doing that. Uh, the next one here is IgM. So IgM is usually found as a pentamer. So pentamer means there's five of those little Y-shaped molecules that are kind of attached to one another here. Um, IgM. Uh, tends to be produced in higher numbers uh, in an initial infection. So, for example, if I just catch a, a new cold, um, then my I'm going to produce a whole bunch of IgM right away. Eventually, I'll, I'll produce more IgG in response to that particular cold, but IgM is produced most quickly right at the initial infection. All right. Um, next one here, IgA. Um, usually exists as a dimer, meaning two of these Y-shaped molecules connected to one another. Um, it can happen as a monomer as well. Um, uh, IgA is really good for, for neutralization and um, trapping pathogens in the mucus. We see a lot of IgA that's secreted in your mucous membranes. It's also secreted in breast milk. Um, so this is good for catching pathogens that are, that are just coming in um, and trying to enter in through mucous membranes. Uh, the next one here, IgD, is a monomer. We don't actually know too much about IgD. Um, we don't know exactly what it does. So it's listed as a B cell receptor here, but they're all B cell receptors. We don't we don't super know what the function of IgD is. Uh, and the last one here, the monomer IgE. So IgE is going to be incredibly important for um, for immune response and um, and parasitic infections. Uh, so this is going to be a trigger for a lot of your um, for a lot of your allergies, and if you are ever infested with, with say, parasitic worms, IgE is going to be important in fighting that kind of infection. Okay, so all of this adaptive immunity, um, we can get it in in multiple different ways. So we're going to talk about four different ways to acquire this adaptive immunity. Um, and the first way is, is called natural active. So naturally acquired active immunity means that uh, basically just getting sick. So you get sick, you catch a, you catch a virus, you catch a, a bacterial infection, whatever. It looks like this baby has got chicken pox uh, in this picture. So the baby has acquired that virus naturally, right? Somebody got him sick. Um, as he acquired that virus, then he built his own immune response actively to it. So he's, he's creating his own antibodies against that particular virus. Right? So that's natural active immunity. Uh, the picture on the right hand side there um, is natural passive. So the baby is nursing, which means the baby is receiving IgA antibodies through breast milk. Um, so that's a natural process still. Um, but this is considered passive immunity because the baby's not making the antibodies on his own. He is receiving the IgA from his mom. Okay, we can also acquire immunity artificially. Um, so um, artificial active immunity would be uh, vaccines. So vaccines are administered artificially, right? You go to a healthcare setting and you get injected with antigens, essentially. Um, so we inject you with antigens, but then your body is actively um, building an immune response to those antigens. So it's artificial introduction, but active building of the immune response. Uh, and then the, as far as artificial passive, this would be um, just a, a, a hospital or, or healthcare uh, associated injection of antibodies directly. So antibodies that somebody else made. Um, injected into you. So that's artificial passive immunity. Okay, so 
Um, just to kind of look at what's going on over time in terms of antibody titers. So this would be looking at the quantity of antibodies in your system um, after exposure to a pathogen. Right, so at the beginning, on kind of the left-hand side of the graph here, we've got our initial exposure to whatever pathogen this is. So, and this is something your body's never seen before. So I get a cold, never seen this particular cold virus before. Um, I am going to um, start producing antibodies against that cold. So I'll probably produce a whole bunch of IgM at first, and then I'll produce a bunch of IgG, and those antibodies are going to um, develop this, um, do all the things that antibodies do to mount an immune response against this particular cold, right? And then as, um, as we eliminate the threat, as we eliminate that virus, then we produce a little bit less, right? We don't need as many of those antibodies circulating because we already got rid of that cold, right? So, so the antibodies break down, they don't last that long, they get recycled. Um, but what we've done in that primary immune response is also build memory cells. So those B memory cells that are that remember that how to build that antibody against that particular antigen. So when we see it again, so here at our second exposure um, to that same cold, uh, now because I've got the memory cells, my body's gonna go bananas and just produce this huge secondary response. So this is when I encounter that same cold virus or whatever it might be the second time around. Um, you're probably not even gonna feel sick. Um, because at this point, you've already got that, those antibodies, that memory in your system that you can create this massive immune response and just swamp out that pathogen before it makes you feel sick. You might feel tired. You might feel a little bit run down because this takes a lot of energy to mount the secondary immune response, but you won't feel sick because the pathogen will, will likely not have the opportunity to do any destruction uh, before you wipe it out with your, uh, with your own immunity. Okay, so a few questions here to wrap up. Um, so B cells mature in the blank, T cells mature in the blank, and then both types are going to migrate to where? All right, so there's your answer. B cells mature in the bone marrow, T cells mature in the thymus. Both are then going to migrate to lymph nodes and spleen. All right, what is an antigen? What type of cells are considered antigen presenting cells, and what do they activate? So an antigen is going to be any molecule that your body can recognize as foreign and mount an immune response against. Um, antigen presenting cells are macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells, and they activate T helper cells. All right, and last questions here. Um, which cells produce antibodies? Uh, which cells um, are capable of killing virally infected cells in our body? Um, and what cells can we make that are going to help uh, prevent future infection? All right, so the cells that produce antibodies are, are B cells, specifically plasma cells produce a whole lot of antibodies. The cells that kill virally infected cells, there are actually a couple answers to this question. So natural killer cells can, fill, can kill virally infected cells non-specifically, uh, but cytotoxic T cells are responsible for killing virally infected cells in a more specific way. Uh, and then the cells that, that we create to help us in future infections, those would be your memory cells. All right, so I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.